tired, hungry, and many times alone. Since November, there's been a spike in the number of children making the dangerous journey to Europe. According to UNICEF, children make up about 40% of arrivals. Nearly one of every three of the 62,000 migrants and refugees who entered Greece in January were unaccompanied minors. Children, particularly who were unaccompanied, were telling us that they didn't have the money to pay for a trip, so that uh, they in some way promised to the smugglers that they will pay when they reach the destination country. So that this means that they are in a kind of a, a debt, um, they're obliged on this, uh, uh, to return this debt and nobody knows what will have to, uh, they will have to do when they reach the countries where they want to be. Atina, a Serbian-based NGO working to combat human trafficking, says children have been forced to commit criminal and sexual acts. Some of those minors simply vanish from the system altogether. Raros Drovic, who runs the Asylum Protection Center, says the method of trafficking children is getting more complex. But actually, you have whole systems supporting smuggling of kids. Very soon after they reach the camps or uh, after they uh, remain in some place, they got contacts, uh, they got Skype uh, or, or, or telephone contacts of most probably smugglers or even parents saying them to contact someone else who will organize their trip further on. One way the traffickers get children across the border is to pair them with fake family members, particularly through Serbia, says Rados. And there's no way of physically proving that these kids belong to these parents without sort of DNA samples, correct? Yeah, serious, serious problems for the system that are not developed, that are not, that is not capable to, to function, having in mind kids traveling in huge numbers without knowing language, without uh, having them staying for a longer period of time, you're actually facing with a really, really dark sea of troubles and you can't stop this international, intercontinental migration and smuggling of kids. But not all unaccompanied minors are being trafficked. Some have been sent to Europe by their parents to find work and others have been separated from their families. In those cases, NGOs have set up tents at reception facilities to reunite people and the Serbian government has built two centers to handle the influx. Meanwhile, Britain has said it will take in refugee children who have been separated from their parents. Yet for those kids who simply disappear, that journey to Europe has not turned out as they had ever dreamed. Today we learned the attack that shut down computers at a California hospital until a ransom was paid is far from an isolated case. Hackers are hitting soft targets all over the country. The cyber criminals who collected the $17,000 ransom from the Hollywood Presbyterian Medical Center are part of an increasingly lucrative online crime wave. Hackers break into a computer network, lock out other users, and demand a ransom, usually to be paid in the nearly untraceable digital currency, bitcoins. Is it the only option they have is paying the money? They can lose their data. Uh, in, in the most cases, yes. Lillian Ablon, a cybersecurity analyst at the RAND Corporation, has been following the growing use of ransomware. Ransomware attacks tend to be on entities that are smaller, that don't have security measures in place, which is why we hear about ransomware attacks on hospitals, on um, fire stations, on schools, rather than the large companies. Since January 2015, hackers have collected at least $325 million in ransom payments, according to a report by the Cyber Threat Alliance. Victims range from the hospital in Hollywood to a sheriff's department in Tennessee to the city government of Detroit. This month, even small town school districts in Mississippi, New Jersey, and South Carolina have been hit. In the South Carolina schools, the director of technology, Charles Hux, is trying to save the system without paying the eight and a half thousand dollar ransom. Now we're going server by server, backup by backup to see exactly what we have and the time that it takes to restore those backups, uh, and it'll be a business decision. While fighting intensifies in advance of Friday's proposed ceasefire, the Deputy Secretary of State said significant progress has been made along the Turkish-Syrian border against ISIS. And we're working with uh, the Turks to try and get control of that last 10%. Speaking to the Washington, D.C. Brookings Institution, Tony Blanken said the greatest accomplishments against the terrorist group, also known as Daesh, are in Iraq where U.S. forces are working with local fighters. Daesh has not been able to engage in any offensive operations uh, since last spring. Um, and what we're seeing is that not only are we taking back territory, but we're doing it in a strategic way. But Blinken's upbeat on. assessment appears to conflict with recent congressional testimony. ISIL, including its eight established and several more emerging branches, 
has become the preeminent global terrorist threat. These images first broadcast by Fox in January document an ISIS chemical weapons attack against Kurdish fighters. On Sunday, the CIA director confirmed the terror group is experimenting with weapons of mass destruction. We have uh, a number of instances where ISIL has used chemical munitions on, on the battlefield. Artillery shells? Sure. Yeah. Despite the U.S.-led bombing campaign, the director of national intelligence also told Congress the number of foreign fighters traveling to the region since 2012 is at a record high of 36,000 from at least 120 countries. Assyrian government forces, with the help of Moscow, lay siege to Aleppo. President Obama said Russian intervention will not end the bombing, the suffering of civilians, nor significantly weaken ISIS. In another important story tonight, the Justice Department asked a federal judge today to force Apple to unlock an iPhone that belonged to one of the San Bernardino terrorists. Apple says that if it did, all of its customers would lose their right to privacy. Jim Axelrod has discovered there are many more of these battles than you might think. The battle over access to the San Bernardino shooter's cell phone is far from an isolated case. The Manhattan DA's office says it's investigating cases involving 175 Apple products with encryption similar to Saeed Farouk's phone. Cases ranging from homicide to child sexual abuse. Good morning, everybody. Manhattan's DA, Cyrus Vance Jr. It is very difficult to explain to a victim of crime that we cannot get the evidence that may identify the individual who committed the crime because a cell phone company and designer has decided that they know better. Apple CEO Tim Cook says he's fighting the order to devise a way past the iPhone's encryption system to keep his consumers safe. But the reality is if you put a back door in, that back door is for everybody. John Miller is deputy commissioner of the NYPD. He says Apple could develop a code to break into the phone, get the information it needs, then destroy it. Tim Cook says, I'm doing this for the safety of my customers, meaning so that we have an impregnable phone. I have to ask, how many people who died on the floor in San Bernardino or in Paris had iPhones in their pockets as they were being killed by the terrorists? They are Tim Cook's tough customers, too. Today, a senior Apple executive told CBS News if we break this phone at 8 a.m., destroy the code, then at 10 a.m., we get another subpoena. But why is Apple's cooperation necessary at all? Mike Morell is the, the former number two at the CIA. The on Isn't there somebody who currently works for the CIA or the NSA who could do what the government wants Apple to do? There's been so much advance in the last year, 18 months, in the ability to protect information in these kind of devices that the government um, has simply fallen behind in its capabilities. Following the 2016 Davos Confab, a meeting of 62 people, as wealthy as the 3.6 billion poorest half of the world's population, where a major theme was the future of automation as it replaces working humans. As more and more of the population leaves the workplace, economic growth enters a period of secular stagnation. Economist and potential future Federal Reserve Chairman Larry Summers is heralding these conditions as the perfect storm needed to transition to a cashless society. Paul Joseph Joseph Watson writes, Summers has called for the $100 bill to be phased out of circulation, becoming the latest prominent voice to advocate the elimination of cash. The Washington Post writes, Summers calls for a moratorium on printing new high denomination notes in the name of stopping crime and corruption, a global agreement to stop issuing notes worth more than, say, $50 or $100. The inevitable mark of the beast system is fully underway. France introduced laws last year which restricted French citizens from making cash payments over a thousand euros. Italy, Russia, Spain, Mexico, and Uruguay have all introduced similar laws that ban cash payments over a certain amount. Earlier this week, the ECB Council voted to scrap the 500 euro bill, a decision that would reduce the amount of physical cash in circulation by around 30%, despite the fact that such a move would be negative for the currency, according to a bank of America analysis. Last month, Norway's biggest bank, DNB, called for eliminating cash to cut down on black market sales and crimes such as money laundering. 
In August of 2015, the Financial Times published an editorial which called for the abolition of cash altogether to make life easier for a government set on squeezing the informal economy out of existence. We should move towards an international currency because uh, the speculation and the complexity of currency has caused some of the irritation, uh, not only among the trading nations, but among individuals. At a secretive meeting in London last year, Kenneth Rogoff of Harvard University and William Buter, the chief economist at Citigroup, met with the top central bankers to discuss phasing out cash. Former Bank of England economist Jim Levis penned an article for London Telegraph last April in which he said a cashless society would only be achieved by forcing everyone to spend only by electronic means from an account held at a government-run bank, which would be monitored or even directly controlled by the government. The ultra-powerful Bilderberg Group also discussed the agenda to ban cash during its 2015 Comfab in Austria a conference attended by numerous prominent bankers. Basically, we are leaving the era of a strong global economy, brought to a screeching halt by the billionaires that reaped its benefits. Now that small elite plans to govern us all from their ivory tower, promising socialism as some kind of reward. Keep Obama in president, you know? He what? gave us a phone. Meanwhile, major banks are preparing for a bank holiday that could come at any moment as the final maelstrom begins between the cashless society of the corporatocracy running our kidnapped government versus the defenders of our dying federal republic.